in the African American Studies Department at Yale's Endeavor Series. This is like our colloquium where we learn um, <clears throat> and wander together. Uh, this being the second on an anthropology of abolition, also an anthropology of liberation, um, is here with a tremendous group of scholars who I could not be more excited to be learning from. The housekeeping is for those of you um, who are not along amongst the panel, I will encourage you to turn your cameras off. The reason I'm encouraging you to turn your cameras off is because <clears throat> we are recording this and we will eventually be putting this up online is the ideal. And if you do not want to be online or you do not want to sign the paperwork, cameras off is deeply, deeply preferred. Um, the other bit is if you would go ahead and put your questions in the chat, keep your mics on mute and Amy will during the Q&A be able to facilitate um, <clears throat> those questions for you. Please go ahead and put them in the chat, populate them in there. I have a feeling we will have lots of questions for all the tremendous wisdom we are about to receive. Um, so with that, in this spring of 2022, it is my great pleasure to introduce the, the <clears throat> trend-setting, trailblazing pinnacle of uh, the apotheosis of anthropological excellence, Amy Cox, to introduce the rest of this panel. Thank you all so very, very much. And again, welcome to African American Studies Endeavors. Ah, oh, Phil, thank you so much. I knew you would come in hot. So <laughs> even a few minutes late, it's like Phil comes in hot. So thank you so much for starting us off so vibrantly. I also want to thank Vanessa Epps, who's our Senior Administrative Assistant in African American Studies for all the work that Vanessa did to organize all the details around this Endeavors series. Ah, so wonderful to see all of you here and more people are still arriving or at least to see you in your Zoom squares. But I'm not at all surprised given who we are in conversation with this morning into this afternoon. But first, I want to start off by expressing how profoundly, profoundly fortifying, even before we have begun our conversation, the anticipation of a conversation with you, Deb, Savannah, and Kristen is because I not only have deep respect for your work, but I also care deeply about you. And I do think that maybe like two and a half years ago, I may have been a little hesitant to express that sentiment in an academic context, to be completely honest. But much has changed in the past two years and a half. And it, it has become clear to me at least that operating as if care and connection are outside of our intellectual concern or irrelevant to our scholarship constitutes a persistent, if subtle, type of violence. And I would add care and connection are essential for how we think about abolition and move towards it. So this is a conversation that we have been having already in many ways across time, phases in our careers, several different institutions and our own shifting relationship to the academy, our research and the discipline of anthropology. But this is now a conversation that takes place in, and I'm doing this these times, <laughs> Over the past two and a half years, almost three years, we have heard the phrase in these times more than ever. The times that people are referring to could range from the ongoing global pandemic and the lives taken in its wake, global protests against anti-Blackness and structural racism, threats to an idealized democracy, the disruption of identities constructed on strict binaries and scales of comparison, and the realization that former modes of supposed stability through financial security, social respectability, and the accumulation of credentials are no longer viable. I will pause here, but the list could go on as you know. But these are the times we find ourselves in, which also means these are the times the discipline of anthropology and the concept and act of abolition move within and around. The academic iteration of anthropology is also currently confronting a long, let me be clear, a long history of sexual violence that is just one, let me be clear, just one branch on the deeply rooted tree of power held by singular gatekeepers who not only violate bodies and boundaries, but determine who gets hired, mentored, awarded, and which scholarship is legitimized as knowledge. So when I shared the idea for today's conversation with a close friend of mine who happens to be a literary scholar, their response was, and I quote, you mean to say the abolition of anthropology, not an anthropology of abolition, right? Because the abolition of anthropology is the only way those two words can be reconciled in the same breath. And my response was, 
who said we should be seeking reconciliation? I don't know. Can anthropology serve the ideals of abolition? And then what about that slash in the title, the slash in the title between abolition and liberation? Are they truly an and or, or have I too readily assumed a direct link? Can we get specific about our terms so that they inspire action and accountability and not just the ongoing loop of our perpetual theorizing? I don't have easy answers, I doubt any of us do, but we do have the gift of three courageous thinkers to wade in these choppy waters with us. So this is how we will proceed today. I'll introduce our three speakers and then each will offer opening remarks, starting with Dr. Shange. Can I just, can I use your first names? Do you mind? Start, starting with Savannah, um, moving to Kristen and then with moving to Deb. I'll moderate the conversation for about 20 to 25 minutes before opening up to your questions and comments so that we can have a full dialogue in this space. So Savannah Shange, who gets a big hand clap for joining us at 5.30 in the morning. Should I reveal where you are so we don't feel so sorry for you? <laughs> uh, so Savannah is an assistant professor of anthropology at UC Santa Cruz and also serves as principal faculty in critical race and ethnic studies. She earned a PhD in Africana studies and education from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, Matt is at a master's in education, master's from Tufts University, and a BFA in experimental theater from Tisch School of the Arts at NYU. Her first brilliant book, Progressive Dystopia, Abolition, Anti-Blackness, and Schooling in San Francisco, published by Duke in 2019, is an, eth is an ethnography of the afterlife of slavery as lived in the Bay Area. And also, and Savannah, I hope, you add, I hope you've added this to your bio. It's also the winner of the prestigious Bateson Book Prize that's awarded through the Society for Cultural Anthropology. Savannah, we're so happy to have you here. Give your virtual hand clap. Kristen A. Smith is Associate Professor of Anthropology and African and African Diaspora Studies and Director of the Center for Women's and Gender Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. Her work focuses on the immediate and long-term impact of policing on black communities, black communities in the Americas, particularly on black women. She's the author of over 20 peer-reviewed articles and essays, multiple public commentaries, and a brilliant book, Afro Paradise, Blackness, Violence, and Performance in Brazil, published in 2016, which won an honorable mention for the Errol Hill Award in 2017. Kristen is also currently completing three books. Is, is that true, Kristen? No. <laughs> Kristen is out in the middle of three brilliant book projects, well, which I hope you'll talk about as we get into our conversation. Deb A. Thomas, Deborah A. Thomas is the R. Jean Bronley Professor of Anthropology and the Director of the Center for Experimental Ethnography at the University of Pennsylvania. She's the author of Political Life in the Wake of the Plantation, Exceptional Violence, and Modern Blackness. Thomas co-directed the documentary films Bad Friday and Four Days in May, and she is the co-curator of a multimedia installation titled Bearing Witness, Four Days in West Kingston. Prior to her life in the Academy, she was a beautiful, she still is, not prior to, she's still a dancer, but she was a professional dancer with the New York-based Urban Bush women. Can we give our, um, a virtual hand clap to our esteemed panelists today? So I want to open up with you all opening up and your opening remarks. And I, I want you to open up in whatever way feels right to you. But if this is a helpful prompt, I thought we might kind of interrogate some of the assumptions that I might be making in the terms that I'm using. So abolition is a word that many of us use now. I would say in the past maybe five years, it's become more mainstreamed, associated with policing and the carceral state more specifically. But then now it has this sort of traffic and people are sort of attaching it in the way that we do in the academy. And there's this assumption that we're all using it or understand how we're using it. And I'm wondering um, how you enter this conversation and your relationship to the concept of abolition. But then I thought, am I also making an assumption about anthropology? Right. Do you in this moment consider yourself an anthropologist? What is your relationship to the field? Um, because your work is housed in an anthropology department and read by anthropologists or not, how do you assess your relationship to the discipline of anthropology? 
and this could be within and outside of the academy. And then how do we reconcile or not, you know, referring to that question from my friend, the concept of abolition and, and what, we, what we understand to be the practice of anthropology. Or you can just ignore that and just whatever you want to say to open up is fine. But we'll start with Savannah. Savannah, I'm going to turn, over, turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much for that really beautiful introduction, Amy. Um, and it's so wonderful to be here with so many folks who have um, literally uh, shaped my path to this moment. So it's wonderful to be here with you, Kristen and Deb, too. Um, so, yes, I feel like this past year and a half has really, I think, highlighted for me the need to be clear about what it is that it means when we say abolition, because I feel like 10 years ago, it, I feel like people who said it, I was on the same page with them, right? Um, and now it's, we're in a different moment. Um, and actually just recently I finished um, working on a piece trying to work through this very concern. So I think I'll share maybe a couple pages of it and then talk about how it brings me back um, to this moment. And so it starts, do you remember, uh, maybe some folks here, June and July 2020, when in addition to our communities, you know, uh, raise, rising up in the streets, our colleagues who were not in the streets were rising up in our emails to ask us to appear every six minutes. You remember that, right? And so what started as a series of, you know, we had some really generative conversations, but then on when you're on the third talk in the sixth week, right, um, you start being kind of a black thought vending machine. Right, it's a Pez dispenser for bites of abolition. And I realized, I'm just gonna say, I put myself in that position <laughs> by putting abolition in the subtitle of my book, not knowing this is where I was going to be in this moment. And so I really have been thinking about what it means to use um, the kind of Baulian logics that come out of search engines like Google, right? In the ways we even literally title our work, right? Because then the same engines of surveillance and kind of um, digital capture then serve to lubricate certain kinds of pathways um, to finding um, certain kinds of works as an entryway to something like abolition when there's other places, um, namely the streets that you live on and the places that we work, right? That are better entrance points, at least I think more earnest ones. And so I was asked, in one of these sessions, um, how do you maintain faith in anthropology while doing abolitionist work? And this was a really earnest question from a fantastic and you know super engaged uh, graduate student. And I realized that I had, the fact that this was the question really let me know how off path I was because embedded in the logic of a question like this, and this was a good faith question. This was not, you know, this is someone really trying to do the best work they can imagine. There's a twin assumption that one, anthropology and abolition are reconcilable. And that two, my spiritual investments include academic discipline, right? That's wrong on both counts, but it's really on me for having set that up. And so I think that as someone who, for better or worse, has like hung my hat on abolitionist anthropology as a phrase, I think I set, but set up both the audience in these kinds of spaces and myself for the okie doke because monographs are meant to be consumable, right? They're biteable, they're citable, and abolition is supposed to be ignitable, right? These aren't the same kind of function. And I think it's important to remember that abolition is not a metaphor, right? And that our notion of abolition um, it's essential that it doesn't get defanged and deracinated within these kind of self-evident boundaries of a discipline or the academy. And so to maintain faith in abolitionist work uh, in, in anthropology while doing abolitionist work implies a temporality in which, like Amy said, the discipline is ongoing and abiding, right? While abolition would be a tactical modifier of labor in the meantime. The desire to deserve to conserve the discipline in the face of impossible demands harkens to what Ryan, what Ryan Jobson that same year named the anthropological fix, right? Whether it's technological, statist, Boazian. And Ryan reminds us that rather than looking to the discipline to bolster our faith, quote, the decisive action required to resolve a crisis in anthropology, on the contrary, will not be confined to the halls of convention centers or university departments, and of course not to like a, a Zoom webinar, right? because abolition is not a fix. It's the reverse, an unfixing in the sense of disrupting both the locus and the function of captivity. 
given the distance between our discipline's liberal center of gravity and the demands of abolition, it becomes clear that the question from this graduate student had it all backwards, right? Instead, I'm wondering the reverse. How do we maintain faith in abolition while doing anthropological work, right? And so I couldn't think of this on the mo at the moment. This is kind of, I was thinking about this in response to um, this really kind of generative question. And for me, the answer is clear. Every empire falls and this little settler dumpster fire that we find ourselves in is no different, right? The planet that we fret so much about will be absolutely fine, right? The earth will heal itself and regenerate life time and time again over the next billion years. The question is, uh, is about whether humans will be around to bear witness. And so any student of history knows that the structure of the United States, like any nation state is also gonna change and morph in one way or another in the next few hundred years. But most likely, those transformations will fortify the fatal forces of white supremacy and patriarchy, right? Um, the question is how we intend to both shape and survive those transformations, right? So in 2021, 20, 23, will we see the North American corporate military structure grow even more powerful in the ruins of neoliberalism? Or will we see autonomous communities accountable to indigenous land stewards hold large swaths of land? Will it be a both, right? And so I think, mm, I think the last piece I'll share here is about where ethnographic practice, practice and anthropological ways of knowing fit in here. And I think that amidst all of the kind of morass that the person you were talking about, Amy was saying, this has to go, right? Amidst everything that has to go into the bin, let's think of it as a compost pile and the anthropology has to go into, right? Which means it's gonna have to decompose and something else could potentially be fed from that. Um, and particularly there's parts of the disciplinary toolkit that are really useful for world making. Listening deeply, bearing witness, challenging the inevitability of the state, right? Building deep transnational and cross diasporic relations. In particular, as kind of surveillance and policing and imprisonment become globalized as techniques of repression, anthropology can help us disrupt US centrism while cultivating thicker solidarities that function as political kind of pathways. And so for me, abolition is about attending to the break, stretching open the cracks in captivity's infrastructure. And ethnographic practice is a technique that can help us attend to life as it is in this moment one that has the potential to attune us to world making as it's, it's happening everywhere, right? And so, um, Amy, do I have another minute? Please, please, go ahead. Okay, so, um, so t was anybody at one of the first critical resistance conferences that's here? Feel free to say in the chat. Do y'all remember the one, there was one at maybe, uh, I was at the one at Columbia, but there's one before that, maybe at Riverside. And so at these initial um, CR conferences in like, 97 and 99, correct me on the, the years, um, when folks said abolition, it was understood as a very direct reference to the destruction of the prison industrial complex, right? Policing wasn't even that central to the table at that moment, right? It was really specific about the prison industrial complex, what some people would now kind of call mass incarceration, but that's not the call. The call is to end all incarceration, right? Not justify certain people's captivity. Um, in order to free others. And of course, the theory of prison abolition was not born at that conference or any conference and kind of the history of anti-carceral thought goes back, you know, depending on how you want to map it from, you know, Du Bois, from, uh, uh, it, there's lots of ways to think about it. Joy James has a great kind of um, historiography of that. But it wasn't until the 2020 uprisings that the abolitionist proposition pierced to mainstream US consciousness with the cogent demand, right? Defund the police. And there was so much hostility and patronizing happening in response to that, that folks literally, like Miriam Cobb had to literally write a op-ed that said, yes, we mean literally abolish the police. And so in the meantime, there's this, been this rebranding and kind of bad faith efforts to co-opt abolition as anything but, right? And I have plenty of examples of that that I won't share. Um, but for me, what I've been thinking about is what are the different modes of abolition. So even among those who are in the in the wheelhouse of okay, ending captivity and all of the things that could cause it, there's still a, a lot of kind of generative diversity within that frame. And so I've been thinking about abolition um, as kind of five years of a moving stick shift vehicle. Stop, shout out to everybody who can drive manual um, using Chela Sandoval's um, theory of differential consciousness that works through a, a gear. And so those gears would be we might think of as abolition as rupture, 
right, which is changing the conditions of captive captivity, right, rupturing the common sense that produces captivity. So someone like Mariam Kaba and the Insight Collective, right, those are folks who are moving in this world. Also thinking about anthropologists that engage that. I actually think of your work, Kristen, um, as really moving in that mode of abolition in the sense that, yes, you attend to anti-Black state violence in Brazil and the U.S., but also to the sequelae that trail behind that spectacular event of violence and the lives of mothers, partners, and children of the slain, right? And so by tracing those afterlives of violence that mirror this kind of threat of neglect and harm, you make sure that we interrupt, yes, the spectacular event, but also the threads that come before and after it, right? Um, you might think there's another mode of abolition that's abolition as revolution, right? Direct confrontation with the state, a kind of tradition of abolition that draws its power directly from ongoing revolutionary struggle led by incarcerated people and polit political prisoners. So folks like Joao Costa Vargas or Asami Burton, right, engage in this tradition even within anthropology. Um, and they're not doing that work as anthropology, they're doing that work as anthropologists, right? And so in trying to figure out how that happens. You also might um, look at folks who use abolition as healing, right? Really doing that work of accountability and transformation and in doing the work of creating practical safety in our communities and transforming the impact of interpersonal harm. And so someone like Brendan Tynes, who works on survivor organizing, I think really kind of lifts up that tradition of abolition in our discipline. Um, uh, the last two were thinking about abolition as geography. Right, building spaces of self-reliance. And so I'm looking to someone like Ashante Reese and her work around self-reliance to help us sketch out what might that practice look like <clears throat> um, in the discipline. And finally, abolition as culture, right? As the practice of finding one another and building um, kind of spaces between people because abolition is something that only lives in the space between people. And so here I'm thinking about Deb, your work, um, not just kind of the end product of the films, um, you know, of, of the of the film uh, and the, so thinking about Bad Friday, thinking about Bearing Witness, but also thinking about the long form process to produce those as operating in that um, kind of register. Also like the podcast Zora's Daughters, the site Black Women Collective, right? This work of producing um, abolition between us. And then for me, I'll just take it home with, um, the folks that I learned most about abolition from is the Black Organizing Project, which is an organization that I'm a member of. I'm an anthropologist who is a member of the organization. I'm not an anthropologist of the organization, right? I push in chairs, you know, I tuck in, you know, push in chairs, I make phone calls, I'm on the phone tree. Um, this image that you see here is from um, a retreat that some of the organizers put together. Um, this is the crew of folks who have been. Um, holding the George Floyd resolution for the elimination of school police in Oakland, which successfully passed in June, 2020. The uh, Oakland School Police Department has been abolished. The guns have been melted down. The cars decommissioned. They are off the payroll, right? And in the past year and a half, it's been this group of people that have been helping to create new um, job descriptions for the security staff. They've been creating new safety trees for different kinds of incidents at the elementary, middle school, and high school level, right? Really doing this kind of dreary week to week, week work of producing abolition in real life. Um, and so I brought them here as my own kind of uh, guides in this work. Thank you so much, Savannah. So, so much to think with. I'm, you know, I'm just thinking about the five, I don't know if you would call them tenants or, or entry points or um, interventions in the way that you think of abolition, but each one of them gives us gives us so much to think about. And um, what I love about that is it doesn't begin and end with an ultimate, rupture is not the beginning and end, right? Rupture is, is one node. And so that there's a way that we can see the work that we're doing, the steps towards a, a bigger rupture, if we wanna call the rupture the revolution, there's steps towards that. And there's ways that we can, um, see that in our work and the daily work that happens, whether it's inside the academy or outside of it, so that we don't have to constantly be operating in these false binaries of activists, non-activists in, in sort of sort of old school ways that don't speak to the ways that we can um, be attuned to the possibility for transformation in what might seem like the smallest acts while still not relying on those small acts to do all of the work. Right, but there's a progression in the way that we understand what abolition 
means or what it could mean. So thank you so much for that. Um, Kristen, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, before I get started, I just wanna make sure I thank everybody. So I definitely wanna thank you, Amy, for pulling this all together. Um, it's just really, it's beautiful to be in, in conversation. And I know that we're not in person, but there's something comforting about seeing all of these wonderful and amazing faces that have inspired my work. I, I'm gonna echo um, Savannah's words. Uh, Savannah's work, your work, Amy, Deb's work have really inspired the work that I do as well. And so I just feel like I'm in community right now. And I just wanna say thank you. Um, and I also wanna say thank you to Vanessa Epps as well for helping us get all organized um, prior to this moment. And thank you for the, to the Department of African, of African American Studies um, and the Yale and Davis series for allowing us to be in conversation. So I wanna start just really, really briefly because I'm not sure um, how much people know who I am or what my work is. And so I just wanna start by saying, um, I'm gonna talk about uh, the anthropology of liberation and abolition, right? And I definitely wanna get back to some of the things Savannah said, because Savannah, your interventions about those five points, I really appreciate them and they got me thinking about some things so I can't wait to talk to you about them. Um, but my work has, focused on uh, thinking about the terrorizing impact of policing on black people, particularly in Brazil, but across the Americas um, for the past 20 years. And so when Savannah mentioned the fact that, you know, in, in summer of 2020, when all of a sudden abolition becomes this mainstream word, for many of us who have been doing this kind of work around anti-Black policing for quite some time, that was a vertigo moment. Um, it felt really interesting because it meant that the hegemony was shifting. It meant that the terms that we have been using for quite some time had been pulled out from under us. And so I wanna just kind of underscore that because I think that that was part of the thread that Savannah was getting to, but I think that one of the provocations that's in this panel is what do we do with the terms that comfort us? What do we do um, with the politics that we have become familiar with and where is it leading us and, and where do we go with that, right? Um, and so, you know, quickly, my work has been on the gender dimensions of anti-Black policing and particularly the unique frequency of Black women's experiences with policing. And what this frequency says about space, about time, about gender and anti-Black violence. For me, my work, and this is gonna sound different to those of my colleagues who are bona fide archeologists, but I really think of my work as archeological, right? In that it entails excavating the cemeteries of Black life across the Americas through time and space in order to map, mark and catalog the artifacts of black life in the wake of anti-blackness. And I use the, the phrase in the wake to follow Christina Sharp's brilliant theorizations of the wake, right? So for me, this archeological work of tending to the dead and the living is what anthropologist Faye Harrison has called decolonizing anthropology or what anthropologist Kishikan Perry has called an anthropology for liberation. What is that? Well, in, to paraphrase their understandings of it, it's an anthropological practice that focuses on the possibility of undoing the, 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 excuse me, the coloniality of anthropology through the distortion, and I use that word very specifically, through the distortion of its normative practice in the service of those that it has historically sought to catalog in order to be colonized, right? Or to follow Zora Neale Hurston, Hurston seeking to upturn anthropology's legacy as the deep practice of white supremacy's need to know. And so part of what I see embedded in the title of this conversation today is in actuality a question, right? Um, can we have an anthropology for liberation? Can we have an anthropology for abolition? And what are the internal contradictions that are inherent therein? Right. 
So for me, intending to the dead and the living, and and I want to underscore that my work intending to the living has necessarily been in community with the dead because most of the times when I am doing my ethnographic and anthropological work, I'm working with those who have been left behind um, after their loved ones have been killed by the police, right? Which is a very grief-based um, and tender practice. I'll just say it that way. And so one of the things that I am constantly attentive to, and this is something that I also find inspiration in, in Deb's work, right? Particularly around witnessing um, and thinking about how do we have these conversations in the aftermath of violence, but how do we excavate our stories without violating yet again, our graves? After all, grave robbing, is a traditional fundamental element of the anthropological slash archeological process of excavation. In conducting my research, I constantly grapple with this fraught tension. Rigorous qualitative research, at least within the bounds of traditional anthropology, seems to require that we as ethnographers journey into the communities of the dead to peel back the layers of people's lives and sentiments in order to discover the truths of the past and the present. Yet, there is something deeply unsettling to me about this process that pushes us to rethink the meaning of liberation. What does black liberation look like and what does it, it entail? So as somebody who spent my entire career doing work in collaboration with black movements in Brazil, I have learned a lot from them and from those movements. And so I wanna, I want to situate what I'm about to present as learning from, as opposed to studying on, because I think that that's also one of the themes that comes through in this conversation. What does it mean for us to engage in collaborative processes that are not based on extraction or somehow based on the continued processes or continued um, the, the continued practice of genocide for lack of a better word, but instead seek to learn from and be in community with folk in order to find solutions to our common experiences as people with targets on our backs. I'll put it that way. And so one of the things that I've learned is that if we are to possibly have an anthropology for liberation, whatever that looks like. And I love the questions that you put to the front, um, Amy, because I'm not sure, I'm not convinced of anthropology. I'm also not convinced that anthropology and liberation can be in conversation with one another. That is definitely not something that I want to reify. What I do want to do is to say, if that is a possibility, if there is something there, what might it look like, right? Um, and for me, to center Black life and Black freedom must necessarily upturn imperialism, upturn heterosexism, upturn misogyny, in addition to anti-Blackness. And I put those things alongside that because I think despite our efforts, we still engage in the incessant practice of linearity when it comes to understanding oppression. Meaning when we're talking about anti-Blackness, we tend to think about it as separate from gender, as separate from imperialist, imperialism, as separate from various heterosexism and things like that. And I think that that is still a frontier as familiar as that may sound, right? And so in thinking about that, I have started to think about the question or the practice, the historical practice of quilombo, right? Or a quilombase, right? Which is the practice of maronage in Brazil. And Savannah, when you made your comments about abolition um, and abolition as territory making and, 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 and community building, et cetera, I couldn't help but think about the practice of quilombo in conversation with that because despite the fact that the, the word abolition 
does not come up in the conversations in Brazil around Quilombo, right? We can think about these things in conversation, right? In diasporic conversation. Um, and specifically thinking about the practice of Quilombo to follow Beatriz Nascimento, which is this idea, not only of building spaces of refuge, but of building war encampments. And the reason why I want to bring out the idea of war encampments is because I think that one of the things that may allow us to think about an anthropology for liberation is to think about it as of offensive, right? As an offensive tactic, not as a defensive tactic. And embedded within the notion of Quilombo is an inherent understanding of the ecologies of violence that we are up against. It is an inherent understanding that we must build spaces of refuge. We must build spaces uh, that will prolif proliferate black life and reproduce black, black life. But entailed in that is defending ourselves in some way, shape or form, right? Whether that mean taking the high ground and establishing ourselves in the mountains, or that mean setting up autonomous economies, or that mean somehow figuring out a way to fight back against our oppressors. And so I want to put that on the table because I think that in order for us to think about the possibilities of anthropology and liberation, there must be some sort of break going back to something that also Savannah said, there must be some sort of break with anthropology as we know it. And that break has got to be, has got to be defined clearly. And so if we know anything about Maronage and we know anything about Quilombo, the practice of Quilombo, in many ways, these are territories that are created and autonomous spaces that are created by people who escaped slavery, right? Um, enslaved Africans who fled the institution of slavery to create autonomous societies and then fortify themselves against the onslaught of violence that was in opposition to black freedom. What we know is that Quilombos are never outside of the colonial space. Quilombos are never located in an area that is beyond the zone of oppression. And so I think for me, that's a helpful place for us to think about what an anthropology of liberation might look like, because to think that we are gonna get out of the zone of the zone of the colonial zone of oppression of anthropology by practicing anthropology is not realistic. But what does it mean to set up fortified enclaves of resistance within a colonial space of war that will fortify us and lead to the possibility of our liberation. And so to me, this notion of a quilombase, right, is one that we might be able to use if we are to embrace the possibility of putting these three terms into conversation with one another. And I'll end it there, thank you. Ah, thank you so much, Kristen. There's so much, I, I wanna move to Deb, but I just wanna name really quickly. There's so much in what you said, but I kept coming back to something you said early on about the terms that comfort us. And then I started to think about the way that terminology and concepts without action become sort of inebriate us, right? The seduction and, and inebriation of these terms that don't have an action tied to it. But then I was also thinking about the ways that language is a trap and can fix and in some ways not totally capture what is happening on the ground. So I'm just gonna briefly, and some of you have heard this, this story about how I came to anthropology. As an undergrad, I was taking a course that I did not know was an anthropology course. So it was an upper level anthropology course and we were reading these beautiful ethnographies. And to me, what I recognized and what was called anthropology, but I didn't know it was called that yet until like sort of the middle of the semester, I realized what we were up to. It was very much to me, a black feminist practice because the way that we were talking about these ethnographies and the practice of um, field work was very much about how you come into a community, how you learn how to be a community, how you immerse and humble yourself what it means to take people's experiences seriously, to listen to stories, 
and to be be a witness more than a documentarian. And this is the way that I, without the name of anthropology, there was a way. So if we think about what is there, what is the there there? What could be retrieved? I'm wondering if the terminology keeps us from seeing what can be retrieved, the labeling of the thing keeps us from seeing what is possible to, in your terminology, Kristen, excavate from practices that we're already doing without having to fix it to a name. So I just wanted to, to speak to to speak to some of that. There's so much more in what you said, but I'll just leave it there because I want to pass it on to, to Deb. Well, thank you very much, um, Amy. And uh, I echo all of the thank yous that Kristen and Savannah have already put forward. Thank you for gathering us. Thank you, Vanessa, for organizing us. Um, and, you know, I love being in dialogue with y'all and uh, have missed the sort of in-person um, moments of huddle and hugs and laughter and really good food and um, conspiring uh, together. And I think that is something that, um, you know, we've really lost over the last two years. And I think that's also that, a big sense of um, strength, you know, for many of us going back to our own institutions are these moments when we get to um, draw, uh, draw energy from that care that we experience with each other. So we do it online. It's not quite the same, but it is, um, it is lovely to see your faces. Um, Amy, where you sort of just intervened, I think is where I might start, um, which has to do with the question of anthropology and the extent to which we situate ourselves within a field called anthropology. And, you know, you and I have had this conversation before, and I'm sure it's true of many of us here in this space and beyond. Um, but I think like, like many folk, I sort of fell into anthropology I did not apply to PhD programs in anthropology. Um, I had been dancing, as Amy said, with urban bush women. And um, even before that had always been working through theater or other kind of performative practices as a way to enter community, as a way to think together about, you know, becoming conscious together of the problems or issues within community that we wanted to confront. And then finding ways through creative practices, through the arts, through just uh, embodied pedagogy, I suppose, um, to attend to some of those issues. And that was my background as a performer. And that's what sort of drew me into the academy, but um, you know, not directly into anthropology. And one of I had applied to a um, Latin American and Caribbean studies program, and that's where I started. And one of my first classes was an anthropology class. And I just, you know, remember recognizing again, like you, Amy, in the method of what we were reading, that that was something that I felt like I was already doing and, and that I didn't realize that there was a name for, you know? And then when I took, and that class was called Transnational Processes. So you can imagine, you know, with the person who would become my advisor, Connie said, you can imagine it was a seminar, it was a progressive take on globalization and historicizing the inequalities. Um, that were becoming exacerbated in, you know, sort of late 80s through the 90s. Um, and when I then sort of did the backtracking to do the history of anthropology and the theory of anthropology is when I understood what I was getting myself into, you know. And when I think, again, for many of us, you consciously suspend disbelief in order to get to the thing that you think you know you're already doing. You know, um, so, you know, yes, I'm an anthropologist. I, I, I love it for the things that you're talking about, for the method of um, learning, for the method of being in community, for 
um, a mode of gathering that can enact something in the world that needs to happen. Um, but ultimately, I guess the way I consider myself is as a, um, you know, someone who assembles archives, you know, archives in my case of, of violence and of state violence in particular, and of struggles against state violence and visions of a different world in the face of state violence. But these are archives that could be stories, they could be performative, they could be sonic, they could be visual. And, you know, the archive itself is not the end, right? The archive is then a tool um, in order to create something else, you know? And so I think that's sort of the basis of my, um, the, the scholarly work that I do that ends up in articles and in books, but also the scholarly work that I do that ends up in community festivals or films or performances or, you know, other kinds of institution building. And not everything is for everybody, you know, not not every iteration of an idea is for all audiences. And so to me, it's so important to think about audience when thinking about the work that we're doing. You know, what do I want this to do in the world? And therefore, who is it for? And what form must it take in order to do what it's supposed to do for the people it is for, you know? Um, so that takes, you know, that takes on many different kinds of things. And I guess what, you know, it could, it could have been anthropology, it could have been many other things. And, you know, I didn't go into this to become a professor that happened at the very last minute. Um, but, you know, there could have been many other professional paths as well. I do feel lucky to be in a space where um, I have the time although it never feels like I have time, but, you know, in theory, I have the time and absolutely have the resources to distribute, you know, in other ways. And I guess I see that also as um, part of a mission, you know, which is to uh, use the resources of this uh, very wealthy, um, very large, very decentralized, in many ways, amazing university toward the furthering of um, community projects within Philadelphia and beyond. So again, that looks like many things. It looks like a Kumina festival that a friend and I organize every year in Jamaica, or it looks like the conversation that we're hoping to host during the Kumina festival about land dispossession, you know, in, you know, the particular community, but also tying that to what's going on nationally and transnationally. Um, or, you know, it looks like this article that I'm really late on about sovereignty um, that I'm trying to put together for a volume, or um, it's a new film that we're working on that uh, really sort of dissects the 70s in Jamaica by looking at the Ethiopian Zion Coptic Church and the kind of um, bizarre intervention they made into um, you know, socialist politics and Rastafari race relations, I guess I could put it that way. Um, and I think, you know, though I am situated in an anthropology department and have actually been editor of an anthropology journal, I am often not considered an anthropologist um, or, you know, I, I have I have heard or overheard, I guess, people looking at my book, my most recent book or other work and saying, oh, it's great, but is it anthropology? You know, so I think that, um, you know, and I'm getting to the abolition question in a minute, but um, I think that, you know, while those of us who are, um, intentionally attempting to transform the disciplinary space that we're in um, are sort of working through the language of abolition or of decolonizing or um, liberation, some of the other words that have been used today. I think it's also important not to be too attached to the label. You know, I think we would be, fighting those battles anywhere, 
and in any of the spaces that we occupy. Um, so, you know, some of the work that I think is super important or that I spend a lot of my time on right now is also creating spaces within this institution um, that are really about undoing, ultimately are about undoing the institution. Um, and our center is a space like that, the Center for Experimental Ethnography. And we were very privileged to host Amy as one of our first fellows. Um, but that center is uh, organized to support faculty and students who have a creative practice as the basis of their research process. And we have had filmmakers, we have had dancers and choreographers, we have had visual artists, textile artists, we have had sound artists, um, creative writers. This semester we had Amitav Ghosh and we staged a musical version of a parable that he recently wrote. Um, and, you know, the point is to understand artists as intellectuals and creative work as intellectual work and to therefore transform the modes of knowledge production, right? So in a way, it's trying to bring the university to what I understood as knowledge production before entering um, the university. So. In that way, it is about decolonizing. And um, in that respect, I also would say that all of these words that we use, I would, um, I tend to use them in the gerund form. You know, even to think if we agree that sovereignty is a process and a practice and that liberation is a process and a practice, then, you know, obviously decolonizing and abolishing are also processes and practices, and they're not events, you know, they're not something that happens and we can say, oh, we're done, you know, we've, we've solved that problem. It's an ongoing modality of life. And I think um, that, oh, thank you <laughs> for putting that in the chat. Um, that uh, guides me. Um, you know, in sort of everything, um, everything I do, you know, so like in considering, you know, am I going to give this talk or am I going to work on this project or are we going to co-sponsor this event or, you know, whatever it is, it's who is it serving? Who is the audience? How does it move through a process and practice of decolonizing, abolishing, liberating? Um, and, you know, how does it create joy? in our worlds and in our lives. Thank you so much. I, um, as you were speaking, Deb, was thinking about how much of the work of abolition is about remembering what, you know, what I knew before I came to this, what I was already doing, what I had been doing, and that through sort of the training and the disciplining of our minds and our bodies and, you know, a context post all of that, that our work, that maybe the first step in abolition is a remembering, a deep honoring of what we, we already know and we hold in our bodies and in our spirits. Um, and I just wanna say, you know, for, for everybody listening, I know you're listening intently, put there's some questions in the chat that I wanna get to. And what I've tried to do um, as you have been giving your opening remarks is just kind of pepper in some things that I wanna expand on as in between your remarks. And really, because what you're saying is so rich and so sort of layered, you kind of hit on the other prompts that I wanted to ask. So I want to make space for us to be in genuine conversation because people always say that, like, it's just a conversation. And then it's not. So, you know, and I think Kristen said this was the first one to say, oh, I want to ask you more about this to, to Savannah. So I want to open up space before we move to the questions in the, in the chat for you all to talk to one another, if there's questions that you have of one another about your work, about something that you said today, I just wanna allow that space for us to practice, practice, see that, to practice conversation for, <laughs> for us to be, to be in conversation. Um, so I'll just open it up. I don't know if you, if there was something that you wanted to start with Kristen. But I was gonna say, I'm, I'm like jumping into the line. Here. Yeah, please. Yeah, I have please. a couple of questions. <laughs> exactly, Savannah, I'm like jumping in. Um, I, so one, I have two questions and, and one is for Savannah and one is for Deb. Um, I would really 
appreciate because part of what is really inspiring to me about your work, Savannah, is just how much practice or praxis um, is the center of your work on abolition, right? And so everything that you do is in conversation with community. And, and in thinking about those five understandings of abolition, I just wanted to hear you talk a little bit more um, about how we create those possibilities in community and what does that look like, right? Um, and for Deb, you know, I, I am always inspired by your research and all of the amazing kind of community work that you do, but I am also inspired by the ways that you engage in institution building and disruption, which is one of the things that you mentioned. And, and one of the things that I think has been um, a key aspect of that is your ability to bridge community with the university. And so I wanted to hear you talk a little bit more about how we do that work, because I think that that is part of the process of decolonizing or liberating or abolishing whatever gerund we want to use. Um, I think at the heart of this, this conversation is that process of breaking down the university walls. And I think that CCE is a good example of, excuse me, CEE is a good example of that. And I wanted to hear you talk a little bit more about that. I love these questions. Look, before, I know it's not my turn to ask a question, but I'm just going to say it anyway. When you said the hegemony is shifting, that is so, I mean, I don't know if my Trekkies are out there, but it's like the Borg is adapting. It's like just thinking about the ways in which, um, oh, child, you see it, they got me, they got me. I just said, it. I just said the ways in which they got me. Thinking about how um, malleable and how adaptive, how like, fundamentally creative death and captivity are, right? And so I think there's that element. Um, and so I think these five years, this is just, I mean, it's like five stars in the night sky, right? It's not a, a, a container, right? They're just kind of points to look at. And so I think part of our job is not to fit into these, but just to, you know, make more and more clear the clouds out the way so we can see all of the ways our community is getting free. And I think, so that's one piece. So I think, I think I am oriented towards a proliferation approach to abolition, right? One in which, I think I said something about this earlier. Some, somebody was saying something about, oh, going towards abolition, right? And so I think certainly in terms of a revolutionary tradition of abolition or one that's oriented around um, the end of the prison industrial complex, that's a very clear end goal, right? And the prison industrial complex is a like giant black squid of a Leviathan, right? So to end, so the, it's one thing to end, to close all the prisons in the world, right? And so similar, I'll think of, think of it in terms of practice, but you know, the Oakland School Police Department is abolished, right? And the day the last cop left schools, are our children safe? No. It's, a, it's one, one, one particular kind of vacuum of captivity does not actually produce the world that we need. And to me, that's the distinction between abolition and liberation, right? Abolition is, I mean, I, I, I know Ruth Gilmer has that amazing conception of thinking of abolition as growing things. Again, these are different ways of thinking about it. You know, they're all gonna work. But for me, it's helpful to think about abolition as that vacuum, right? and that doesn't actually take any of the responsibility away from us to build a world worth living in, right? And that that's not, it's not only not an end goal, it's also not anywhere near enough, right? And so that's part of what I'm concerned about too, that all of a sudden the floor has become the ceiling when the end of captivity has become our, 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 our dream of what, of, of that's, that's, that's what we go to the altar for? That's what we're pouring libation for, just to not be in captivity? And so I don't think so, but I think when part of that cohabitation of language can also be a domestication of political imaginaries, right? And so for me, I'm really invested in abolition because I like destroying things. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's my gift. I like breaking, I like ripping, right? But you can't just have that. That's just, I, we need a team, right? And so I think that, is, so don't, so I guess for me, nobody mistake my particular interest in destruction with a political program, 
because that is not it. You know what I mean? It's going to be way more. So that's not, that's one thing. And so then when you said, how do we do this work? Dr. Smith, who is we? And I'm asking that because I think that I was literally you. thinking about we as in the small we that's mm-hmm. in the room, but I really mm-hmm. take that point because that's a good one because that's part of what happened in summer 2020. Mm-hmm. And it also happens, I'll just say, you know, as like bougie black people who have moved to another place paying very high rent, right? Not always, but often the place that we don't live or live in a different neighborhood than we grew up in, right? And so I think for me, it's important that who is we is not just about like race, class, gender, right? But also about like belonging and different layers of indigeneity and nativity such that the folks who are directly impacted are leading the work of whatever that is. So when we're doing organizing about working conditions in academia, right? That That's us right here, right? We're doing that, right? <laughs> and when we're doing organizing around you know, the hyper surveillance and policing of welfare provision, right? We are, even if we may have been on WIC before, if you're not on WIC right now, you need to be in a listening role. You need to be in a like supporting and, 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 and amplifying role. And so for me, that's why I asked about who is the we, because usually I'm not the we. Um, And it's my job to really kind of remind myself that, so. Yeah, that's such an important point, Savannah. And I think it's also um, where I might start to think about Kristen's um, question about uh, community and the university. I mean, I think that it's an impossible relationship, you know, especially on a campus like Penn and like many others that has just continually expanded to the detriment of the surrounding community and there's constantly and is, you know, this week um, uh, organizing around, you know, building that's happening, um, you know, on one particular um, end of the campus. So, you know, we can understand Penn as, you know, a growing space that is dispossessing people with a long history of dispossessing people. And honestly, even this building that I'm in, which is the anthropology department, which is in located in the Penn Museum, which was built on, a, you know, the former site of the Philadelphia um, Blockley uh, Almshouse. Across the street is Franklin Field, which was the potter's field for the almshouse, again, dug up and, uh, you know, in order to create uh, the buildings that are currently here. And in fact, for those of you who know some of the recent history of revelations around what's going on in the Penn Museum, I mean, some of the crania who that ended up in Morton's collection come from the Bloxley Almshouse and our Black Philadelphia, right? So, you know, these are the histories we inhabit that I inhabit daily. You know, I walk into this building. I am here with the people living in the building, with the ancestors living in the building, and on top of the people whose graves were destroyed in order to create the building. So, you know, community building in a universe, in this university space is, um, you know, impossible, really, like theoretically impossible. Um, That said, uh, again, with the view toward redistributing the resources of the institution beyond its uh, walls, I mean, I think the arts is really, you know, a way in which at least I know how to do that. Other people know how to do it through other mechanisms. But since that is my background, that is the tack that I take. And Um, And it's always a negotiation and an ongoing um, struggle of recognizing uh, recognizing the assumptions that you have and the moments when you think everybody's on the same page and then you realize that you're not and, oh, maybe we should have had a conversation about this or I wouldn't have thought to have a conversation about this or, you know, it's going on right now. Um, in, a, in a good way, in a productive and generative way with the collaboration that Grace Sanders Johnson and I have um, on a course that we're team teaching right now called Citing Black Girlhood. And 
One of our community partners is the Colored Girls Museum in Germantown that's run by my very old friend, Bastai Dubois. And, um, you know, there have just been moments when we have to sort of regroup and say, wait, what did you mean when you said that? Or, or how, is this, how is this going to work when we travel to Jamaica or when we travel to South Africa? You know, how are the portraits going to go with us? How are the other portraits going to join that exhibit? You know, there are all of these things that, you know, we each may have particular ideas about the logistics surrounding them, but the logistics come out of a, you know, of a theoretical and experiential um, morass. So, you know, they're all things to be constantly negotiated. So I think I would just echo Savannah in talking about listening and inhabiting the listening role. Yes, as Kristen just wrote in the chat. Um, but I would also say that I think all of these words, um, abolishing, decolonizing, liberating, have um, sort of temporalities also. I think there are times when we do the Weberian politics, you know, the, the hard boring of hard boards. And there are other times when it is the moment to burn it down, you know, and we have to be able to recognize when, when, when is which time, you know, when to just say, you know what, this isn't going to work. We're not going to be able to go forward in that way and actually torch it you know, and then sort of move in a different direction or regroup, come up from the ashes and think again about what we want to build. You know, we can't beat our heads against the same wall forever. We have to build the new wall and see if it holds. Thank you so much for that, all of you. I'm looking at the time and I think what I'd like to do is go to some of the questions in the chat and I'm gonna combine, there's two questions that were directly messaged to me and I think they're related. So is it cool with y'all if I read both of the questions and then we can see if we can kind of answer them, if you can answer them together. And I think you might have touched on some of what is being asked in the question. So you could just might maybe amplify just a little bit of what you've already said. But the first one, um, how does care, love and tenderness come into y'all's respective work? I'm thinking about Bell Hooks, King's Beloved Community and Cornell West work. Amy, you started our conversation expressing the care that you have for our speakers. I'm wondering what practices you take in your daily lives that cultivate spaces or communities of care. All right, so that's one question, right? And I think, tell me if I'm stretching here to try to combine these. How can we keep the sacredness and rituals by the people we are working with and learning from without having to adopt a colonial supremacist method of the, in quotes, need to know or need to explain? Can something just be sacred or unexplainable? Can part of our method be embedded in the mystery in our work? And so I, I throw those two questions out for you to ask, answer them individually or how you might see them connected. Maybe I'll start, okay. Um, Definitely opacity, I think, has to be um, a guiding principle of anthropological work for it. And there's, there are many people who have um, moved toward that in different kinds of ways and ethnographies that are um, models, I think, of that kind of work. I think Ana Lara's um, work, Black Freedom, Queer Sovereignty, Black Sovereignty, Queer Freedom, um, uh, is one example of, of that kind of work. And I think that is care work. You know, the respect for um, the right to not be known, to not be parsed, to not be described to death, um, and still in relation. I think that that is definitely part of a practice of care within a research process. Um, I think also for, uh, for me, in terms of practices of care in life <laughs> generally, or in the life, in the academic life, um, you know, has to do with gathering and creating the conditions for, for gathering in ways that can offer um, support and love and really a view of the whole person and to also acknowledge one's own vulnerability and need for support and love and the need to be seen 
as a whole person. And, and part of that is also about mentoring and, you know, trying to make sure there are um, more and more and, you know, exponentially more Black women who are at the stage where they're able to enact their true vision, you know. Um, I think Black women constitute, Christina actually, Sharp told me this one time when I was like agonizing over how many tenure letters I had to write one year. Um, she told me that 2% of full professors are Black women. And that's why we get asked to write for every body in every <laughs> discipline. And I think, you know, one can see that and feel that as a burden, of course, but if one sees it instead as always enlarging the community and in always being in a condition of learning together and sort of embracing the work of others in, um, in a fulsome way, then I think that too is part of a practice of care. Did um, Savannah or Kristen, do you want to address either of the questions or there's another? Can, oh, go ahead. Wait, there's we another. The oh. same thing at the same time. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, mine is brief. I think, I mean, obviously everything that Deb said. And it's interesting that you talked about the mystery of our work, Amy, because I think for me, one of the ways of interrupting these kind of like, I'm not sure this is exactly what you're asking, but kind of this colonial um, affects of extraction in our in our workspaces. Is that part of what you're asking is part of what you're asking about, like how do we not rehearse that when we're in community? Um, I think rather than mystery, one of the things that I've really looked to is transparency, which is normally the inverse. So you, you might be a, in, a mystery when it shows up on JSTOR, but I think in the work having more transparency, which I think initially I thought was about like, oh, sharing the writing, see what you think about, but actually really being transparent about the labor. Like, what is this thing that my job is? Like, how does, how does, how do you get paid? Like, what's, what is the seed? What do you need to get out of this in order to keep your job? Like being very um, clear about kind of the CV and the, you know, the pace of productivity, all those other kind of things that I think are really submerged in our work. And we never talk about it in the pieces that we're writing. <laughs> and we also rarely talk about it with community, right? But then as opposed to being, um, I think conversations I thought that initially um, were about like, oh, you know, do you support this project, right? So even when I was doing my dissertation, I, the kinds of relationships that I had with folks. I knew some people already, right? I had some relationships because I had, you know, I'd worked at the school for several years. And when folks participated in the research, it wasn't because they were like, we want to contribute to anthropological knowledge, right? It was like, oh, Ms. Shanke is going back to school. Ms. Shanke wants to become a professor. This is her dream. Let's help her, everybody, right? And people be like, this is so good what you're doing, baby. We love you. We support. How can we help you, baby? This is so wonderful. And it wasn't because they were like, you're going to be a great anthropologist of our community. They were like, we see that you want something and there's something that I can share with you that helps you get to where you want to go. And that was their gift to me. So it wasn't that I was kind of bringing back some kind of gift to community. It was really them saying, you want to do this cool thing. You want to be a professor. We support you. I got to sign this thing and tell you a story. I got that. Right. And so that for me was a gift from community. And I think that kind of transparency moving forward into the work that I'm doing now to be like, hey, I need to write an article in the next two years. It can really be about anything. <laughs> We can talk about like the space that we're sharing right now. So the project that I'm working on right now, um, in terms of the political work I was sharing before, talking with the folks and then being like, hmm, well, I really wanted to work on writing too. That I, I'm actually a poet. Is that something we could do together? So now we're in a very kind of like slow form process of writing together what we're thinking of as like a collective history of the process of producing the George Floyd resolution, right? which might at some point show up in an academic journal or some version of that. But really it was because of being able to have this conversation about my labor, right? And then also being able to be like, this does not have to enter this space at all, <laughs> right? We don't have to do any of that. And then I will go and write, you know, another, another piece about another thing, right? And so I think that transparency has been a part of being able to hold care um, in terms of the kind of, nuts and bolts labor aspect of producing scholarship. Mm, I love that. 
so much. And it's, it's not, Savannah, there's nothing I've ever seen in any sort of um, textbook on activist research methods. The transparency question is never about what you just said, which is really would just change everything in terms of the relationships that would be developed, right? And it's like, well, I reveal that how I'm gonna use the research on the IRB and signing these forms of consent, but to be really honest about the capital that is gained for you as a researcher in the work and what that means. Um, thank you for that. I'm wondering if, I'm looking, I'm gonna wait for people to add a little bit more to the chat. There's one more question it, that was privately sent to me, but I think you kind of already answered it. But I wanted to see, because Kristen asked, asked a question and I'm wondering if Deb or Savannah, you have a question for your interlocutors here. Can I say something about the healing thing really sure, soon? Yes. Quickly? Yeah. Um, because I, I, I mean about the um, care, because of, I wanted to add this question of healing um, because at least for me, part of what I've really tried to do in my work um, and when I say work, I mean that really expansively, not just in the research topic, but also just kind of like how I engage with the academy and how I engage intellectually, et cetera, is creating spaces of healing for people, um, which is about community building, et cetera, but it's also about caring for the sacred, right? Um, and, and caring, you know, caring for people's spiritual selves, right? Um, and so I wanted to put that out there because I think that that's something that also goes unsaid and people don't necessarily talk about that. But I mean, um, in a lot of ways, what we do can come back to allowing people, giving people the space and the time to heal um, in ways they may not have been otherwise because of the neoliberal insistence on production, right? And so sometimes we just create enough space for somebody to just have a moment where they're actually thinking about themselves and thinking about their lives and thinking about what they've been through um, in a way that's protected and safe. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. Savannah or Deb, do you have a question for this collective, this trio? If not, I can ask. I mean, I have, I have nothing, but I mean, I have nothing but questions, but I just like this piece about, is it great, but is it anthropology? Um, is wild to hear from you as the person who literally made me into an anthropologist, like out of thin air. <laughs> um, because I have no anthropology degrees. Um, and now have this anthropology position, I think, because I was an apprentice to you in this work, I think in a really real way, an old, old time version of how it means to come into a profession. But just kind of reflecting on this, is it great, but is it anthropology? I was you know, also being asked um, by people in, in, in great positions of power in our discipline during job, job, you know, to get the job that I have right now, what makes you one of us? Like really like tests of faith, this kind of test of faith around anthropology. Um, being, uh, it's just wild that it doesn't stop uh, to hear that. Hey, I'm not. <laughs> and I don't mean that. For I did not say that is how I got to this position. <laughs> Pro tip, if anyone here gets that question, answer ethnographically. <laughs> it works every time. Yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm looking at the time and I'm, thinking that we can move to um, closings. Like, what do you want to leave us with? Um, I also had a question about teaching, but I'll save it. But just what is, there's so much to think with here. I mean, I think we could, I mean, we could go on for, for two more hours at least, but what is the thing you want to leave us with? Or maybe it was that, I love that idea of the burst of light. And I think you put it in the chat, Savannah, that when we're thinking about those five nodes or those five tenets, really the, the stars in the night sky, the burst of light. And maybe there's something that has come up in this conversation today that is another like star in that constellation that we wanna add to this dark night sky. Um, but yeah, can I, can I start with you, Kristen? To, to close us out with what you would want us to continue to think with? 
That's a great question. I was, it's, you said a burst of light and all I could think about was Audre Lorde's A Burst of Light. Um, and, and really kind of thinking about, you know, what Savannah was talking about in terms of stars and um, constellations, which to me, bursts of light and stars, all my brain goes together with those things. Um, and so, I mean, for me, I think I would probably leave us with, um, leave us with the thought that in order for us to be able to really get to a point where our work is moving us in a direction that feels like it ensures life and it is freeing, right? Because freedom is a word we haven't really used yet, um, but it's in, it's embedded in this question of abolition and liberation. I think that we we have we we have to keep searching for new alternatives and be comfortable with our discomfort. I think that that to me is really important, meaning we cannot get to the point where we're so comfortable in where we are that we neglect to remember the need for constant struggle and for vigilance. And I think to me, that is something um, that I wanna leave us with. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Okay, vigilance. Oh, Deb, go ahead. Savannah, did you wanna go next? Yes, because I think Deb should have the last, last word. Oh, wow. um, <laughs> did it. Um, has I, mentored everyone in this on this call. everyone list where and are the flower emojis where answer. are the flower emojis put the flower emojis yeah. in the chat because deb deserves the flowers now yeah. not no roses i want orchids bougainvillea okay something with a little flavor a little movement um but that have i think this is going to sound, I don't mean this in itself like a, like a, uh, what's that word grandiose way, but you know that saying that folks will ask in certain kinds of community spaces, um, what kind of ancestor do you want to be, right? And thinking about that as an orientation to um, political work, to life, certainly to like family inheritance, right? I think it's also applicable within anthropology, right? In terms of what is the table we're setting for the meal that we're not ever going to be able to eat, right? So like water, and I, Deb, I really heard you speaking to this. And again, like you, like, this is, this may not be the time of the space, but like the levels to which you have really created infrastructure for life and survival in a place that was not designed for us and not for yourself, right? Tunnels, pathways, bunkers, right? You are like a real general in this war and in ways I don't know as always said, specifically about you. So I just want to lift that up. But like when folks are writing about, like think about like in 2016, somebody's doing a review of this and that. Like what is the thing that they want that you want to be right before your little parentheses? And not in terms of your theory, right? But what is it in terms of how are you positioning yourself in this genealogy? Are you offering something that might be worth something to somebody? Right. Um, and I think that's also true in our in terms of our teaching. In terms of our family legacies, in terms of our political work, because I, you know, I don't, maybe, listen, prove me wrong. I don't think that I'm going to live to see what I think of as liberation, right? And I also feel like I'm responsible for offering something that might be of use to the person who is going to be there, you know, at that moment and at that day. And it's not going to be something big, right? It's going to be something small. But I think that for me is how I orient towards this and similar, you talked about teaching. I really want to talk, I would love to hear your teaching question, but in classes, right? I hope the thing that the students get is not the knowledge, is not the content, right? Not the, 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 pay, the quotation in the book, but something they can take with them and put in their pocket and fondle between their fingers on a really hard day, you know? Yeah, that was- I'm, I'm sorry, I was just tapping in the chat. Yes, 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 Savannah, that's totally how I think about teaching. And then I always feel like I'm doing it wrong. I'm like, this is about your your spirit, right? Anyway, Deb, take yeah. us home. Yeah, I was just gonna say that, um, and, and this is on my mind because um, graduate students and a couple of junior faculty have raised this question recently you know they have a thing that they're passionate about that they think they should wait to do until 
until what? Until the dissertation is done or until I get tenure or until, until, until. And I, I think what is important is to do the thing one is passionate about now and figure out how to work it into the thing that's going to finish a dissertation or get tenure or whatever, because if we do not live our lives, our dreams, if we do not bring our whole selves, but instead try to contort constantly into whatever the figure is that we imagine people want to see from us um, in these spaces, then the spaces themselves will never change, you know? And one does one's own mental health a disservice to not pursue the important question, the creative writing, the activism, the organizing, all of the above together, whatever it is. So I guess what I would say is the true transformation can only come not only because we inhabit these rarefied spaces, but because we inhabit them as the total people that we are with the desires that we have and that we bring everybody with us into those spaces as well. Oh, thank you. I was writing in the chat. So my teaching question was, you all already answered it. I was just wondering how we, you know, we've talked about, you know, terminology and how we think about and across institutional spaces, but what does it mean, not just in our own research, but in the classroom? How, how do we teach? Are we doing that when we teach? Um, and I, I don't know who said that about, it's not about the quote, it's, you know, it's, it's <laughs> what can you take with you to move through these, through these streets? Oh, anyway. Um, I just want to say before before we log off that we have speaking of teaching and speaking of the next generation and mentorship that we have with us in our company, some of the um, newly admitted graduate students in African American studies and so they're here listening to this conversation. Um, so glad to have you all here so glad you could make it. Um, I have nothing but the deepest adoration for all three of you. And the work that you do is has liberated my ability to be in the academy. And I mean that sincerely. Um, you know, from the first time I met you, Deb, I realized that it was possible to be in the academy. What is it to be in it, but not of it? To be in it, but not of it, right? And to find that way, I think June Jordan talks about this, that you're moving through spaces, right? Like an eel almost, and you without getting anything on you, but as you're moving through spaces, you're creating those tunnels that Savannah was talking about for others to come through behind you. So maybe they don't have to be so slippery, right? <laughs> maybe they can be upright as they move through those tunnels. Uh, so anyway, I just wanna thank everyone for coming out. I am, please forgive me, I do, we have another, Endeavors session, I believe on the 20, let me look at my, we'll send you all the notification, but we'll be discussing Eli Anderson's latest book, which will be very exciting. It'll be myself, Eli, uh, Eli Anderson and, and, and Gerald Jane. So I hope you all can make that. And I'm gonna look on, I believe it's the 21st, uh, but, but you'll get a notification about around that. But I just wanna thank you so much, Kristen, Savannah, Deb, and for all of your wonderful questions. This was, this was just like, just the bomb that we all need in these times. <laughs> and today, I mean that this week, like I needed this so, so, so desperately. Um, take good care of yourselves. I'll be speaking to you soon, I'm sure. Thank you all for coming out. And see you soon and next time.